Hello and welcome to our Smart Manufacturing series. Today's discussion with our AWS partner Syntax will be a deep dive customer success story, the road to digitalization with Nitrex. I'm Miriam Kutcher and I will be your moderator for today's discussion. So let me begin by setting the stage. Working with AWS customers and partners, we see how critical it is to optimize OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, to improve operations in smart manufacturing. So how do you gather the necessary information to make better planning decisions and respond more quickly to changing conditions? How do you unblock and analyze data to uncover insights and enable continuous improvements from individual assets, production lines, and entire sites? What does the roadmap look like to get to the results that you need? To answer these questions and more, I'm pleased to introduce our two presenters. Dave Thielet has spent the last decade developing IoT initiatives for a wide variety of business critical use cases, including maritime shipping fuel efficiency, building utilization, and food processing animal monitoring. He's built collaborative partner ecosystems that help industrial leaders go to market, solving digital transformation challenges for Fortune 2000 customers. Today, Dave leads two global industrial connectivity initiatives focused in manufacturing and agriculture, working with our AWS partners and leveraging AWS IoT services to solve vertical specific challenges for operational efficiency and productivity. He received his MBA from Ohio State University and is based in Cleveland, Ohio. Dr. Dominic Schaefer has a research and development background and spent over eight years on new distributed computer paradigms with a focus on IoT and edge computing. He can, he's contributed over 30 scientific papers in areas such as smart cities, smart home, and smart manufacturing. Today, Dominic is the lead solution architect for IoT and data science at Syntax, and together with his global team, he designs and builds the best of breed IoT solutions based on AWS and SAP technologies. Welcome to you both. Dr. Schaefer, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Miriam. So first of all, let me introduce Syntax to you. Um, we have a big footprint uh, and a history in, in building and customizing ERP systems for our customers over 40 years. Have a long lasting uh, collaboration and relationship to Oracle as well as SAP. And um, our history and our partnership with AWS. We at Syntax have over 30 years experience in digital manufacturing as well. So. In 1990, we started with our own solution in the MES area uh, that was called Adicom. But over the time, since 2010, we focused on SAP technology. So SAP ME, MII, as well as very recently the SAP DMC. So everything around MES systems. So. Still, we have our core competency uh, in the area of SAP manufacturing, but as I said, um, requirements grew and we saw basically two use cases that our customers have and that we support our customers with. On one side, the shop floor use case. So for example, a customer built an MES system uh, together with us and um, we have uh, things covered with that, like uh, leaving the operators of the machines, production planning, and so on and so forth. But after that, there are different requirements and, and challenges such as predictive maintenance, predictive quality, process control, asset, asset management, spare part management. All those things um, are not covered by a standard MES system. So we really focus on those things with our industrial IoT portfolio and focus on extending the functionality of those uh, MES installations that we have for our customers in the direction of IoT. The second use case that we serve is the so-called connected product use case. So our customers produce products. So in this example here, an electrical engine. And at some point, this engine will be uh, at the end customer side, right? 
so running. Uh, and uh, for our customers, it's in interesting to extend their portfolio as well and to uh, connect those so those assets in the field and generate value added digital services for their end customers to drive their business even further. Start with a deep dive into our customer story that I brought today, uh, which is about Nitrix. The idea what to do was to reduce the scrap rate and to improve the overall equipment efficiency for these furnaces. And um, a major challenge there was the number of the brownfield installations of Nitrix. Since they produced furnaces over the last uh, decades, and those furnaces have a long life cycle as well, it was very interesting for Nitrix how to connect brownfield installations and, and all the furnaces to the solution as well. But the overall goal was to build a cloud portal for Nitrix based on our application templates to have process control to reduce the scrap rate and to maximize the the um, availability of the ovens so going in the direction of for example predictive maintenance and predictive quality for those for for the end customer so how did we as syntax work with nitrix um so this is this is our blueprint how we together with our customers uh, approach problems and approach their um their requirements so we start with a workshop phase um and out of this workshop it's very important for us to start with an mvp very early so this is a smaller product uh, a smaller uh, project that we do and for us it's important to have a benefit for the customer very early so it's not a MVP having like an end-to-end -end connection, bringing data into the cloud, seeing the data, everything's fine. No, it's important for us to have a feedback loop, for example, back into the existing systems and um, having a benefit for the customers that they can use and um, something that they can build up upon. Um, then we had two phases. Um, two implementation phases for rolling out the solution in, in, in different ways. And at the end, we had the operation phase where we supported Nitrix. But let me get one step further and let me talk about the different steps that we took together with Nitrix. So as I said, in the beginning, we had the workshop phase. So we identified together with Nitrix the potential of the solution. So we sat together and, and asked what are the main challenges currently, not only for Nitrix, but also for their end customers. Um, and together, based on that, we derived use cases for, for Nitrix and for the end customers as well, where we could use our solution to uh, create um, a benefit. Hey, Dominic. Yes. If I could, if I could maybe ask a question or, or interject something here. You know, one of the we see we see in these types of workshops with AWS um, a mixture of you know IT folks that have traditionally worked with AWS in the cloud mm -hmm. layer. Um, OT folks who are actually doing the work on the shop floor. And then there's also like a sort of a business component of, mm -hmm. you know, uh, of folks involved. And I wonder if you could maybe elaborate a little further around kind of some of the stakeholders that participated from Nitrex in these workshops and, and not just sort of identifying the different use cases, but how those may have been prioritized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, normally it, it begins with management, right? So this is the main main driver in the beginning, also here with Nitrix. Um, but really early, we insisted, um, or we insist always in those projects on bringing the right people at the table. Um, and as you said, uh, it's important to have IT on the table very early, uh, since especially for bringing the MVP on track, it's important um, to not work against IT, but rather work together with IT because there are already established um, 
processes and established routines that they have that we can adjust to. But also, as you said, bringing OT, bringing all the process experts and and the the domain matter experts on the table was very important. So um, this was this was basically the setup that we had. So business management, um, the IT folks, but also the people who are really involved in the furnaces and the processes as well. So um, this was this was um, basically the setup that we had for the for the uh, initial workshops. Yeah, and basically, um, as a result of those of those workshops, we 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 create the roadmap for the MVP. Um, so this is this is something um, where you need all those stakeholders I talked before at the table uh, to to scope this 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 MVP um, and also focus on the business case development was 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 important for us. Um, so maybe it's a good point to to um, point out what focuses we had on this MVP and and what roadmap we created overall for Nitrix. So um, the first thing was that we that the main the main focus was to reduce the scrap rate. As I said before, this is the major major problem uh, in this industry. So this was the main focus to have control and have a constant quality. Um, another thing is the throughput uh, optimization or reduction here. So basically bringing down the, the time um, of in between the processes to being able to optimize the throughput and also focusing on the uh, uptime. So optimizing the uptime um, to be able to improve the, the output of the furnaces. To realize that, um, we wanted to reduce the maintenance effort on the on the furnaces as well. So not having preventative maintenance and and planned maintenance um, to to reduce or um, having no unplanned maintenance, but rather going in the direction of predictive maintenance was also a focus. And on top of that, we were able to have digital business models as well. So integrating with the entire enterprise landscape and and having the service um, team in the background up and running to to establish new business models, digital business models for for Nitrix. The basic pillars that we used for realizing that was machine analytics, process analytics, as well as quality analytics. That's really interesting, Dominic. I think yeah. um, most of our customers that we talk to that are in either, you know, could be a process manufacturing type of organization like we're talking about here, but even on the discrete side as well, you mm -hmm. know, we see these kinds of common problems quite regularly when it comes to things like managing the uptime of equipment or reducing scrap uh, waste in the process. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's a lot of MVPs and pilots that take place, but having the, you know, you mentioned some of the management or the business aligned folks that are in the room, you know, having them there and validating that some of these one versus another is a more compelling event, um, business challenge, you know, it's not just a problem, but it has a direct impact either on the revenue growth potential, the cost potential, uh, situation or or a risk profile scenario, you know, having somebody there validating that in the room is really critical. Is something we found um, in in prioritizing what you go after. Otherwise, you end up with, you know, a science project that might technically work, but is not going to be something that will scale and move across an organization and really drive, you know, a, a transformational change in the processes of that of that company. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, and and for us, this is this is the reason I said it before. Um, we asked the question, so so we build up the roadmap uh, for the MVP, and continuously asking the question, where's the early benefit for the customer, and and how can we show the benefit of the solution early that everybody who's on the table 
um, is committed as well. Yeah, and this is this is really our focus, and um, not having, as you said, the science project around that, but but rather uh, giving the management um, an easy easy uh, decision to make. Yeah. Yeah. So this this may be getting into the next slide a little bit, but how much of the roadmap, and, and maybe we want to advance to that, how much of the roadmap do you agree upon with the <laughs> customer at this point? You know, obviously mm -hmm. you agree on the MVP, but but beyond that, I'm just curious, you know, what was Nitrex really committing to um, in this MVP? What were the key kind of outcomes that that you were looking for and in, in, in that MVP? Good question. So um, especially for the MVP, we really have in the beginning already a, a, a scope that is that is fixed where Nitrex committed um, to a couple of use cases that we will cover that you will see in a second as well. Um, but the MVP is a very important mechanism for us as well to being able to scope the rest of the project because um, many customers of ours, um, they don't really know what they want in the beginning uh, since IoT is this it, it is a really complex topic. So asking the question, how much data is your machine generating? Uh, asking the question, um, what data points are required for you to to really make um, a good um, to, to generate the insights that we require? All these questions cannot be answered before we do the MVP, right? So basically, uh, we agree upon. The, the points that we do in the MVP, which is an end-to-end -end pilot as, as written here. Uh, so we do the first data evaluation and see what business outcome is possible based on the data. Yeah. We do the initial setup of our, pro of our solution and we start the, the data collection. This is something that we agreed upon with Nitrix in the beginning, but um, we have then uh, the scope set up for the for the phases that that come that that are uh, after the the MVP however the MVP is also a vehicle for us to really scope all the phases that we have after it yeah. um so this this brings me to the MVP as i said uh, this is a six week engagement that we had for the go live one really important thing to say here um, is that Nitrix had a good starting point since they collected um, a lot of data before before that before even even talking to us um, so what we could do here is we really could start the MVP from two sides so we could start analyzing their data their process data machine data and seeing if we have everything that we require for making um, the predictions that we want to have and seeing what is the business value in the data that we can 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 generate and in parallel we can we could we were able to do um, stuff like the the end-to-end -end communication between the machine and cloud the business integration all that stuff we could do this in parallel so data evaluation as well as setting up everything and doing the end-to-end -end implementation this was really good and this saved us time uh, there are other customers that have never collected their data yeah for sure there wasn't even uh, we had customers where there was no no machine connectivity at all so then we would have another starting point yeah but for nitrix this was um, a head start that we had dominic just on that last point well mm -hmm. if if you were a customer that's listening in mm -hmm. on this and you haven't necessarily matured in terms of data collection, or maybe um, there are disparate data sources often involved and, and you've got some of them, but not all of them. How mm -hmm. would how would Syntax facilitate that? Or what, what would Syntax do to make sure that that data was brought in to, mm -hmm. you know, a, a data lake or something like that that would allow you to then work from it? Mm -hmm. I mean, there, as I said, there are different stages, um, but let's let's take this this example so there's no connection at all um, so that's not not a problem at all because we have um, all the 
tools that we require to connect any machine. Yeah. So if it's an, a very old machine, we can go in with retrofitting, bringing the data out of out of machines with external sensors. So this would be one option. If you have, for example, machines that are equipped with uh, VLCs that are already equipped with Ethernet, we have a solution for that. If you have really modern machines that are maybe but also not connected yet, we can bring the data in over over AWS technology. Um, so we have we have all the, the the options that we have to gather the data out of machines, um, and then bringing the data into into our into our data lake that we build up, especially for IoT. Um, so this is something we would we would do then uh, set up the connection to critical assets. I would say that are interest interesting. So sometimes critical assets means they are critical for your production process and they're very important. So this would be one asset that we would connect very early. And sometimes it's an asset um, where the connectivity itself is maybe critical since it is a retrofit, uh, which has never been connected before or something. So we will focus on the, on the harder parts in the beginning to really solve them and really to build up trust to the customer and bring the data into our data lake. Okay, so um, points in the MVP that we, we took um, is the agreement, um, which location, which machine to take first. So this is connected to the point I did uh, a second ago. So really to, to pick um, the, the equipments that are interesting, um, then also getting the, the local people involved and getting the local people trained up, um, talking to them, really getting getting all the, the information from the people where the problems are and so on and so forth. And also getting the, the hardware there, the, the right hardware, select the right hardware and provision the hardware for the customer and bring the hardware to the customer. So this brings me to, to the MVP outcome. So we did the MVP together with Nitrix and as a result, we connected the Nitrix assets to the AWS cloud, had SAP in the backend connected as well and integrated into, into our solution as well, and um, built a Nitrix specific version of our uh, IoT portal that you can see here in the screen. Um, and we already covered a couple of, of use cases that we defined together with Nitrix. As I said, early success is key for us. So we focused on digital twin. Yeah. So building all the, putting all the master data from, from the SAP side uh, together with the live real-time data from the AWS side, bringing this into our solution um, brought Nitrix already a first success. Then having also the asset management uh, up and running, meaning that you can, for example, um, order spare parts, having uh, the the the, op uh, the option to connect and to to um, create notifications that are asset specific, having all the documentation at at one point, so everything around that. Um, then we started with process transparency, so this is the first um, step in the direction of process optimization. So in the beginning, it was important to really see and know what the process is looking like currently. So not necessarily uh, an automation behind it that intervenes in case something goes wrong, but rather in the first uh, step to having transparency and knowing what's going on. And um, as a first step for, for, for alerting, we also integrated condition monitoring, meaning that you can define rules um, based on the process data that is coming into the system. And based on this, these rules, um, you, you can receive alerts, for example. This was, this was our MVP outcome. Yeah, I think one other thing to maybe point out here in this MVP outcome, not necessarily for Nitrex, but I think, you know, if you look at the use cases you highlighted around digital twin and condition monitoring and things like that, mm -hmm. um, one of the things that that 
also contributed to from an AWS and syntax relationship perspective was some of the work that we've been doing with different IoT services like an AWS IoT SiteWise, mm -hmm. which is AWS a service that um, for, for things like the asset model in that mm -hmm. digital twin, as well as the time series data. And I think, you know, those kind of purpose built solutions help facilitate and take away some of the undifferentiated heavy lifting that comes out of liberating different types of OT data um, that is the foundation of any of these kind of digital twin or uh, condition monitoring or just kind of that asset management uh, type of solution, making that foundation sure and, and uh, uh, capable with an asset model in addition to just kind of uncontextualized data um is is a really critical component so i just i just maybe wanted to call that out too because i know when you first started working with nitrix sitewise didn't exist and it's now since coming to being and is kind of the go-to around that um when it comes to you know having those sorts of assets modeled uh in a way that that allows you to then run the analytics against them absolutely true yeah and um looking back um especially when it comes to sidewise um now we have even a shorter time to market with our product based on on that yeah because as you said you have already the the structure and the asset hierarchies that you can that you can leverage out of out of out of those services um that we use in our uh newer customer projects today yep okay this brings me to the uh, first implementation in the rollout phase that we did with nitrix um so as I said, now we established the MVP, we gathered trust, uh, and we gathered a lot of knowledge about different things. So the processes, the furnaces, and also the infrastructure. Uh, and in our phase one, we focused together with Nitrix on extending the data collection. So now we knew what kind of data we maybe need additionally to the data that we collected before. Um, we started generating insights from the data so as you can see here, um, we, we, for example, had this, this heat um, data, heat curves that we, together with um, process experts, we evaluated this data. We really took the time and focused on how can we gather insights together with the customer from the data and established customer-specific applications together with Nitrix around this use case. Um, so we understood the, 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 the process and we find out where the gaps are that we needed to fill in um, to really drive the, the solution. Um, and also we started rolling out the solution on uh, a set, a set of, of, of equipment. This brings me to the outcomes of this phase. So pretty similar to the, the MVP outcome. However, we have now uh, the focus, we focused on anomaly detection. So automatically checking for events that are not normal to, um, to being able to intervene uh, and alerting the, the, the operator of the machine. This brought us already in the direction of a scrap rate reduction and also the, the optimization of the uptime of the machines. Yeah, this is this is interesting as I think you're seeing to a natural progression of moving from just collection of data and orchestrating that data in a way that makes sense in order to understand what's happening to start to show some business value from that information and the in, insights now to a proliferation of not just you know, additional use cases where you're detecting anomalies, but also leveraging different, you know, AI ML services and things like that, that allow mm -hmm. those activities to happen more quickly and with, with more automation and less human involvement as you move mm -hmm. from, from the MVP phase into phase, phase one and further, probably, you know, as we, as we go on into phase two, you know, I think this, this speaks to an approach that, that, you know, the partnership we have between AWS and Syntax is really driving, which is around this democratization of IoT and AIML uh, services in a way that, you know, in, in the past would have only been available to really deep pockets 
um, or really, you know, extensive data science groups uh, to be able to do some of these kind of things. But by using some of these services, by working with partners who are using some of these services like Syntax, it really opens up for, um, you know, small to medium sized businesses who don't have the resources or historically haven't had the resources to do this type of data science in their own operations, that level of democratization is something we see as a really big opportunity in the market these days. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, you know, partners like Syntax who make that even easier for our customers because they then do further uh, specialization around these different, uh, you know, undifferentiated heavy lifting AIML IoT services. Absolutely. Yeah, that's true. And and it's a journey, right? So yeah. um, predictive maintenance is nothing that you can achieve with a push of a button. Um, but with the services that AWS offers, you can, we Syntax, we help the customer to go um, together this journey to start maybe from a condition monitoring system over to anomaly detection, then introducing first stages of predictive maintenance with services like Lookout for Equipment in the beginning, and then at the end, having a full-blown solution with SageMaker. So this is this is our mindset, how we, together with the customer, um, go the direction, for example, in ML. Yep. Okay. Um, so let's check against the roadmap. So far, we focused on basically the uptime optimization. Uh, we had the first look into process analytics after the, the first phase of implementation, and we reduced the scrap rate uh, based on our quality analytics. Um, so in phase two, we focused on refining the edge setup yeah, so um, optimizing data uh, exchange between the edge and the cloud to reduce and optimize the cost, for example, reduce the, the delays between uh, the data arriving in the cloud and also the delays between having, for example, a problem in the process and um, having the alert on the other side that the operator can react on. So all around this, we, we optimize that. Um, we integrated this on the enterprise level as well. We had a refinement of the machine learning models and we focused, this is a big, this was a big, big part uh, on rolling out the solution in the brownfield. Um, again, jumping to this slide to see what, what um, outcomes this had. You can see now we went into the direction of predictive quality. So really knowing how the process is currently going, checking this against historical data and knowing maybe, okay, we have to intervene here since um, the process will go um, in a false direction. In the, in the future. So having this predictive quality, controlling the process, and also having predictive maintenance as a focus. So knowing when, when the furnace will break down, when the furnace needs maintenance to reduce the unplanned downtimes. Yeah, I think it's, it's not just the unplanned downtimes that maybe I want to touch on with that. If I understand correctly, and, and keep me honest here, but you know, part of what Nitrex is doing is in, proving their ability to service warranties with their customers who might be using some of these furnaces and being able to address, you know, uh, leading indicators of, of failure or of that, you know, original, you know, scrap kind of thing as, as the machine gets out of spec, um, mm -hmm. not just in their own facilities, but then also as they provide SLAs to their customers, you know, there's a, there's a line of service and a new business model that almost gets created out of that. And I, I'm not saying this is what they're doing necessarily, but we do see this with other customers that are moving in similar spaces where, you know, they no longer sell a capital investment in an asset like a furnace, but rather a, an operational uh, expense to that customer as a service where that's, you know, creating a certain type of alloy as a service or enabling that kind of stuff where you're paying for a, a product outcome rather than you know investing in a piece of hardware absolutely that's that's true so um take nitrix so not um 
selling these engines, but rather saying we have uh, heat treatment as a service, yeah, right? And for that, it's a vehicle. Uh, having predictive maintenance is is absolutely critical to maximize the uptime. Yeah, and as you said, not running against SLAs. Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay, um, checking again against the roadmap. Uh, basically, we checked everything, having the maintenance reduction, having also the throughput reduction now checked. Um, so two points were open still. This was the digital business model as well as the constant quality. And um, to cope with that, we went into the operations phase. So what are we doing here? So we manage the service. So really taking care of everything around the solution for our customer. Um, we have um, application management service up and running. So um, 20, 20 by seven, um, we, we focus on, on any problems that the customer has on the application level. Uh, and we focus on onboarding new customers and, and management of the existing customers on the, on the platform. Um, and all the time we focused on, on refining the infrastructure and improving the, the, the current state. So the, the operations outcome was then more the integration on the, on the business level side, as you can see here. So focused uh, on integrating here to S, S4 on the SAP side. So to really integrate the existing um, Nitrix Cloud Connect with their business processes on the other side. Can I ask a question, Dominic, here? Because I sure. think this is also part, you know, sort of the, you know, there, there's a handoff here as you move from each phase where Nitrex is getting more involved in the process and starting to run the process themselves independently, even of, mm -hmm. of syntax around the solutions. And I, I'd just love to understand how they manage the solution going forward um, and, and what are some of the activities that you see as being really important in those kind of handshakes um, as the customer starts to take more ownership of these, these solutions? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So um, especially for Nitrix, it was important to, to take over, as you said, more um, tasks around the product over time. Um, and also for other customers, it's they are willingly to to invest also personal uh, into into these directions. However, um, they require uh, some help in the beginning. So what is very common for us is to uh, bring a customer really fast to the market, and then step by step handing over parts of the solution. Um, into the hands of the customer. So um, everything is possible. Yeah. So really from the one extreme to the other extreme so that we have everything up and running as software as a service all the time, taking everything uh, for the customer. And this is also very, um, so customer see a big benefit from that since um, we can, we know, the, we know the solution, we can further develop the solution. We uh, have, 24 by seven um, uh, support for the solution. But basically we are, we are flexible on that. And for Nitrix, it was possible, uh, important to take over responsibilities over time. No, that's great. Another thought that came to my mind as you were talking was, um, you know, we see this really natural progression from collecting the data and ingesting that data, getting it in a position where it can be analyzed, and then starting to do more advanced analytics on that data as you move through phase one, and then even further expansion across new use cases, um, integration with other systems at the cloud layer as you move into you know, um, the, the second phase outcomes that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I just kind of want to revisit something that you mentioned earlier, but that what we're seeing with customers, which is, you know, a lot of that integration work, the initial response or initial kind of impression that someone might get is that um, it's it's some custom build efforts that are required. And maybe there are some systems that are esoteric and need to, to have that, but how much of what you're doing is really repeatable? 
Uh, mm -hmm. Because we see a lot of the customers wanting, you know, modularized solutions that are relatively off the shelf or, you know, 80% of the way there. And it seems to be the direction a lot of, of our, you know, efforts and partners are going with. I, I'm just curious if you could reiterate or maybe talk a little bit more to how much of, of what we're talking about with Nitrex are really things that that can now be applied in a variety of other customer examples um, to more cheaply and more quickly get them to that that value that we were talking about mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah good point uh, i mean as i said also for nitrix we we didn't start from scratch it's it's rather starting um based on our templates that we built and um there we differentiate between different parts uh when it comes to our modular solution so we have really like a core part of our solution which is um, the portal, user management, asset management, all around that. And then we have different components or modules that take care of those different different use cases that you can see here on the right. And um, for us, it's important that we use our templates to really speed up the, the uh, development of the customer-specific solution because time is, is critical. And um, there are already many, many, many um, customers and, and competitors using um, those, those modern cloud solutions. And so for many of our customers, it's important and critical to, to have a short time to market. And based on this, uh, to answer your question, we can reduce the amount of time and money to bring the customer um, into the platform and bring the customer to their their own solution that they then have. Yeah, and we really reduce the time, and um, this is this is our focus. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, so um, again, checking against the roadmap. So we checked the the point up here: digital business business models with the last step. Um, and still open the constant quality for sure. This is something that um, today, so talking about the current state, um, as we talked before, uh, Nitrix operates and manages their own IoT portal now. So they took over responsibility step by step, um, but we still support and we still work together with them, um, especially for the data science, science topics around that. And we are currently engaged together with Nitrix and the McGill University in Canada into, into an R&D project to further optimize the process control and, and generate more um, benefits for, for, for Nitrix. And this brings me um, to, to wrapping up the, the solution. Um, this brings me to, to our reference architecture that we use. Um, so I will not go into crazy detail into all the different parts as you see this is this is really detailed however um we always have on the on the left side you can see the shop floor of a customer so the industrial equip, equipment such as a furnace or an electrical engine that we connect with our edge connector to the cloud um having on the cloud side the the data handler which enables data orchestration device management um, everything around that then bringing the data into our rule engine that we built that um, enables live evaluation of, of, the, of the live data in real time. And in case something goes wrong, there's, for example, a threshold um, that, that we check against or there is an anomaly that is detected. We generate an event that we can ingest into different um, different enterprise systems such as SAP or Oracle. Um, everything around our data space, so we talked about the data lake before, is uh, a mixture of different storages and databases, database services. Um, and yeah, we have for the prediction side, um, we have a couple of, of AWS services up and running such as Lookout for Equipment, Lookout for Vision, that generate insights 
based on the data that we have in our data space. And we have for, for power users, we have a syntax reporting engine that helps us to really dig deep into the, the um, data, not only the, the, the machine data, but also the business data that we, that we store in the, in the data space. This is, this is great, Dominic. I think the, the other point I want to make on this slide for our audience here is if, if you see, there's a lot of different logos on this from various um, other organizations besides AWS and Syntax here. For example, DeviceWise in the Edge Connector space is a Telet product mm -hmm. that helps with protocol conversion and, and uh, you know, uh, connectivity. Um, similarly, you've got different ERP and other IT systems. We've mentioned the SAP one uh, a few times already. I think I think that begs a point here around really creating a solution that would allow for something like predictive maintenance or product quality optimization is going to involve several different specialists at different layers of that solution. And mm -hmm. I think that's where partners like Syntax help orchestrate certainly with AWS and, and the connections we have through our different services help to, to integrate and do some of that kind of work. But I think it's, it's, um, it's why we at AWS see such value in partners like Syntax that can help put these pieces together for a customer using best of breed in the different sub use cases of, you know, a predictive maintenance solution or something like that. How do you get the data out? Well, we can leverage Telet's product with the connectors that are native into AWS to pull that data into IoT SiteWise, which then feeds in the other, um, you know, database repositories and rule engines that you were talking about, Dominic. Mm -hmm. You know, there are the integrations with SAP and running those things in an AWS cloud that also help facilitate this. And I think that's, you know, there's a, there is not one company that does everything well, but mm -hmm. there are ways to get the best out of every company when you're working in a solution like this and have the flexibility and the variety of different service types to be able to leverage that. I think that's that's a point I kind of wanted to pull out of this as well as, as just sort of how did this solution get built and put together? Um, mm -hmm. I think as an underlying theme, that's an important thing to consider as, as you think about is this something that you as, a, as an organization would want to build, want to buy, want to work with a partner to create that sort of uh, solution? You know, I think that that really speaks to the value of bringing in third party experts for their different components and having a flexible enough data platform that allows for those different um, different parts and pieces to work seamlessly together. Absolutely, that's that's true. Um, and adding up on that, um, for us, is, it's it's also important to close the loop again. Yeah. So you mentioned the integration from from, for example, machine data via device wise. Um, but what it is important very, uh, for us as well is to bring the insights that we generate in our solution uh, back to the user where where it belongs so one example would be so you see this 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 last arrow here that i haven't explained so far um this this brings for example um a work order to the erp plant maintenance system um so we can generate a work order when we see there will be a breakdown of a machine, we can generate a work order in the SAP uh, plant maintenance. And this is really critical to not have another system there where an operator or a maintenance worker needs to check for something, but rather having everything there where it belongs and where the people are used to work with it. And this, uh, yeah, sums up our, our reference architecture. Okay, so, I think we are at the end of our talk. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm very happy to receive your questions.